what are the two biggest mistakes that J.K. Rowling made in Harry Potter? Let me tell you. So everybody knows that J.K. Rowling has been going through a huge controversy lately. Everybody's been wondering, like, what is the biggest mistake of J.K. Rowling's life? I've got two mistakes for you, and none of them have to do with the transgender controversy. They all have to do with Harry Potter. Here's the dealio. In Harry Potter, mistake number one, there's no map. What were you doing, J.K. Rowling? Everybody wants a map of Hogwarts. Everybody wants a multiple-paged map. Maps are amazing. They're incredible. They guide you through an epic journey, the map in Aragon. It's highly usable. You can actually read Aragon, see where he's traveling throughout, you know, the land, to the mountains, whatever. But he's got crazy names. I can't can't remember the names when I read that book at all. If you, if you do, if you're somebody who remembers the names when you read books like Aragon, besides the name Aragon and like Murta and I can't even get Galabrax right. What is it? What a Gal? Yeah, Galvatory. Whatever it is. The map though, amazing, memorable. That was one of my first experiences looking at a map and being like, whoa, this is something that actually helps me understand the book. Everyone wanted that from you, J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter. When you release new editions of these books, make sure that there's a Harry Potter map, a multiple page map, one that goes, you know, like, boom, Hogwarts. Oh, and then up at the tree, like next page, opens it up inside the Whomping Willow map diagram of the secret passage that leads to, uh, wh where does it lead to? Hogsmeade? What is it? What's it? Where's the secret passage? The Shrieking Shack. I can't believe I've forgotten this. I need to read Harry Potter again. Obviously my favorite freaking book. Um, just notes all over this thing too. It's crazy. I can't believe I forgot that. You can, <laughs> my biggest mistake. So second mistake with Harry Potter. Oh man. The second biggest mistake that JK Rowling made with Harry Potter is not continuing to write Harry Potter and going off to write other stories. The fallacy there is that she needed to write another story that was outside the world of Harry Potter. Not true. Not true at all. She wrote a detective series. It has a comical element to it. It's also serious and very adult. Great. People love it. There's a TV show made after it. Cool. You know what I would like to have seen? I would like to have seen the story of Gilderoy Lockhart. Right? Almost like Monk, a bumbling detective that always ends up winning in the end. It's almost like dark because of what he does, the way that he steals stories, erases the memory of the people who are actually heroes on the ground. That would have been amazing. She should have written off series in Harry Potter. It would have been way more successful and it would continue the story into the lives of adulthood for the people who read it like me who grew up with Harry Potter. That would have been incredible. It would have been a better business decision because she would have had more power within the Harry Potter world, the market that she's already developed instead of jumping into a new market. Now, is it an actual mistake? Like, who knows? Maybe she gets more enjoyment out of creating a story that's, you know, some non fantasiful Detectives, you know, she's got several other books too. Like, I can't, what's the other one? I've got a couple of them. No, that one's Harry Potter. It doesn't matter. If it's not Harry Potter, I, I, I don't care. I, what, the Harry Potter books are so rare. Books as good as Harry Potter apparently are incredibly hard to write, right? You've got Lord of the Rings. You've got Aragon. Was, Aragon's good. And then you've got Game of Thrones, which we'll see when the book gets written, whether or not that that's going to actually fix the problem with you know, what they did by ruining the show, right? With the bad pacing, deciding to create the show for the money despite not having a book out. That's a huge mistake. Don't let people make a movie out of your story if you haven't gotten the part where you've written the book yet. All of the books were written before the Harry Potter movies came out. That's so key to why that did good. Could have continued the Harry Potter story, man. Such an incredible story. So much we want to know. So much we want to know. The Gilderoy Lockhart story, please. We would have loved a comical, dark comedy about how Gilderoy Lockhart, you know, did all his story theft, his bumbling, moronic adventures, you know, with the vampires, with the actual vampire slayers, erasing people's memories. We all would have loved that. Or maybe some other kind of story, too. Like, you just wanted a drama story, like... Cool. Tell us about some of the drama gossip that happens behind the scenes with like maybe Albus Dumbledore, you know, tell us some of the dating. So you could have done that with, uh, I can't remember the name of that freaking book. It was like the Cuckoo's Calling or something. I have it too. I can't remember the, the, oh, the casual vacancy. 
you can turn these into fantasies. Like one of the uh, pieces of advice that I give people when they ask me about writing, again, I know I've only got like two books out um, in the big book that I've actually been writing, the one that matters. Uh, I'm just finishing up right now. But it, when people do come to me and they ask me about writing, they say, you know, I start writing a project and I love it. And then the story, you know, like I get another idea and it's great. And I drop the story and I pick it up. And I'm like, yo, totally understand that. You need to learn how to become a wizard, right? You get a story structure. You got a certain amount of storylines that you know that you need to have. And then when you have new ideas, instead of instead of ruining your story by being this little little rat, right? This little dog is like, ball, 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 ball. Keep jumping to each ball. What you do is you combine it into one ball, right? You combine it into one ball. Well, how do you do that? Well, the same thing that I'm saying that you could have done to fix the mistake of not creating more Harry Potter content like J.K. Rowling did. She wanted to write a detective series. She had this idea for a detective novel. Cool. Take that detective novel idea. Fantasical size it. <laughs> Fantasical size it. Turn it into another Harry Potter series. Maybe include other Harry Potter characters that fit the idea for what you're doing. You can combine it. You're creative. You created Harry Potter. And run with that. When I have ideas, you know, I've got my main story idea. You know, I've got this girl who finds out she has the powers to raise the dead who falls in love with this boy who ends up opening the gate to hell. When I have these ideas, like I got my main story idea and then I get like another one, poof. Right, I get another idea. Like what about this homeless guy who like thinks that he's a wizard? He's like obsessed, right? With the wizarding world. And that's the way he looks through the, like his eyes, like see the world, even though he's a, he's a medical genius, right? He's losing his mind because of mental illness. Like throw that in the novel. That's what I did, right? What also needs to stop is any excuse that's keeping JK Rowling from jumping back into the Harry Potter world. Get on it. What's up? I'm Kimmer from Kimmer's Books. Today, what I wanted to talk to you about is this analogy of how writing is like growing a tree in reverse, right? So what is that? What does that mean? It's the analogy that I use to describe my writing process of how to create a story, right? Because like when you read a book, the way that you read a book, it's almost like rowing a canoe, right? Like a rowboat, you're moving backwards. You can't see what's in front of you and you're discovering the story. You can look back, you can see what you've already read, but you don't know what's ahead of you in the path. That's why it's adventurous. You don't know what's going to happen, right? There's clues. There's clues in what you read and you can look back at those clues, but you can't look forward. You have no idea what's going to happen unless you're one of those weird cheaters who looks at the end of the book to see whether or not it's something you want to read. Don't do that. Um, so it, what's this analogy mean? Like it's like growing a tree in reverse. Well, like let's look at a tree, right? And remember those tree diagrams that you did in school where you plotted out like probabilities and sequences of events. Let's take this tree that I've got right here. So this tree here, if you were looking at writing a tree in the way that you would read, right? The beginning of the story would be at the trunk where you put the seed in the ground and then it spurts out. There's an inciting incident. That's this big, huge, thick base for your story, right? And then as you read, you go upwards through the story structure, hit characters that branch out into other character stories, right? There's all these split stories and each of these character storylines, they have these little endings at the tip of the branch, right? And it's very exciting and there's so many different ways that the story can unfold in front of you, right? That is reading. That's how you read a book. That's how somebody writes if they're a, uh, if they do it by the seat of their pants, right? If they're a pantser, which I just think is bad writing, right? You have to use some kind of like story structure and some kind of building so you know where you're going. So this is what brings me to the analogy of writing for me is like growing a tree in reverse. So for me, when you want to create an epic story with all these, all these like little clues and hints, like a mystery, like Harry Potter that lead to this grand finale, what's really important is to know where the story is going, right? If you're a reader and you're rowing your canoe, you know, it unfolds as you read. If you write like that, though, it's inappropriate. You want to know where you're going because you want to be able to guide 
the reader through their journey, right? The reader doesn't know where they're going, but you do. That's your job as the writer. So the way that I look at writing a story is you actually start at the very end of your book or novel, short story, whatever it is. You start at the very ending. If you're writing a book series like I am, like a seven, eight, you know, book novel series, then you start at the very last book at the very, very end. That way you know where the reader is going. So you have all of these character stories, right? And you start the very, very tip, the very end of each of these branches, each of the ending storylines for your characters, right? And then what you do is you work your way back to the inciting incident in the beginning of the story. Now, why do you do this? Why is this effective? Like, why am I so passionate about this style of writing? Here's why. When you write a story, if you start from the beginning where the trunk is, where the seed goes in, right? And you move your way upward through the trunk and into the branches, you have no idea where you're going. It can branch off into a million different directions and your story becomes messy. It becomes confusing. It becomes hard to put together. It becomes hard for the reader to understand how you're getting from point A to point B because the truth is you don't know either. You're discovering it yourself and the discovery process is amazing, but it needs to be controlled. It needs to make sense. A plus B it needs to equal C. And the way that you do that is you want to know your C and you want to know your A. So what you do is you start with the tip here, you create an inciting incident, you plant your seed, and then you work your way, not from the seed to the end of these tips, you work your way from the end of these tips, the end of each character storyline, all the way back down to the seed, the inciting incident. And then that first chapter of your story, that way, when you're writing, guess what you've done? You've created an, a starting point for writing. That's the end, the tip of these trees. And you've created one destination. And when you're writing your book this way, when you're writing your book backwards and not forwards, then you know where you're going. Every single storyline, you start from the tip and you write in one direction, all converging to one final destination. Instead of writing in the opposite way, which is totally confusing, by starting with the seed, starting with the inciting incident, and going into no man's land, not knowing your ending, and not knowing where you're going for all these character storylines. I highly recommend this style of writing. I've seen it happen again and again and again and again and again. When stories don't know where they're going, they're not good. Naruto. Naruto is a great, great manga. Then the anime got ahead of the manga, ruined it. They didn't know where they were going. Same thing, Game of Thrones. Final book didn't come out yet. It wasn't good pacing. So then they came in, they filmed it before George R.R. R. Martin wrote the final book, and it was badly paced. They didn't understand how the branches were supposed to play out because they didn't have the founding material to know where those branches were going to go. They were creating the show just like a reader reads a book. They were rowing backwards and they had no idea what was out in front. They couldn't pace things correctly in their story branches. They didn't go out in a way that made sense for the viewer, right? This is what happened in the movie Lost, the TV show Lost. You, you felt like they had no idea where they were going. You eventually became lost in the show Lost. It was great. It started out epic. It was amazing. Then they had the writer strike. Then they got lost. <laughs> you had no idea where you were going in that story. It just was like, ah, everybody's been there when they've read a story that isn't planned out, where all the pieces aren't already put together. And it's hard from the publishing standpoint because you got, you know that you're going to get things changed up, right? If you traditionally publish, you know that there's going to be this war between you and the traditional publishers and you're going to have to figure out how everything, you know, comes together when they're going to want to change things and you're going to want to keep things later in your story. Uh, and understand that that's difficult and it's, it's, it's tedious, right? It's like a mathematical process. But there's creativity in the process. Every house has a foundation. That doesn't mean that you can't create artistic real estate. Same thing with your book. Every book has a solid foundational structure, particularly the best sellers. Particularly the best sellers. You got Harry Potter, reads so much like the Bible in a much more abstract way, a clearer cut version. You've got Fifty Shades of Grey. It's a pretty much an exact replica of the story structure of uh, Twilight, right? I think it actually was a Twilight spoof or whatever you want to call it, like sexy romance, before it got before it got switched over. So look at writing like growing a tree in reverse, right? You're the god of your story. You don't need to start with the seed. You do want your C and your A. You want your A and your C. And you want to go from C to A. 
right? Highly recommend going from C to A, not A to C, go to C to A, right? Go in one direction. When you go from A to C, you're going in multiple directions. Go from C to A. And uh, you're going to find this process much more enjoyable. You're going to find that it doesn't hinder your creativity. You're going to find it boosts your creativity and you're going to find that it's going to make your story Hey, I'm Kimmer from Kimmer's Books. This is Chaino. Hi. <laughs> uh, today, what I wanted to talk to Chaino about, and you guys, is I wanted to talk about high quality self published books. Haley Fuchs just sent me this in the mail. This, it's an incredible cover. She's a self published author. She's making, you know, she's paying the bills being a self published author with her work. Um, and she has the highest quality self-published books that I've ever seen. They're beautiful. They're hardbacks, which are really rare. Uh, you don't get hardback books with self-published authors. They've got this beautiful silver gloss. Uh, they got shiny title. Yeah, you know? I love the metallic. It really stands out. Yeah, she's got a beautiful art. Like the, the art on this is killer too. And it stands out even more than the traditionally published books that I have in front of me. What I have in front of me is. Uh, I've got Akutar, Court of Thorns and Roses, the hardback, which is a beautiful hardback in this brilliant red that really catches your eye on the shelf. It's a big book. Got Furyborn, which is also a big book. Big books take up good space on the shelves. They catch the eye. Um, so here's the dealio with self-published books. I wanted to go through what makes you know a physical copy of a book attractive to me. Like what are the components of a physical book that are attractive because there's some things that people leave out in traditional books like traditionally published books have things that are left out that i think that are required for a professionally published book right um so you know to me these components are just as important as the cover like if you had a book without a cover that'd be ridiculous <laughs> like if you just had like these pages taped together that'd be that'd be silly and unprofessional wouldn't last long for sure, right? So for one, if you can, hardback book, right? So like Elon Musk said, you start with the highest quality product that you can yeah. in hardback book. Get there if you can. Self-published. Haley found a way to do it. She has she has a beautiful books. Again, the best books on the market. I think it's the best out of all the books we have in front of us right now. So um, what other components do you need? Well, the, the components... Here, I got a list here. I'll just like show you guys a list for what we got. Um, hardback book, pictures. Harry Potter is the only book here that has pictures before every title. And, and some people might think like, oh, that's something that you do for a children's book. No, not even. Let's uh, be honest. Everyone likes pictures in books. <laughs> everybody likes pictures in books. They give you an idea of what the chapter is about. They're, uh, it helps you visualize everything. Help you visualize. From the characters to the places. Absolutely. And uh, there's plenty of adult books that have pictures in them too, including some nonfiction books like Jordan Peterson's, what is that book? Uh, 12 Rules for Life? 12 Rules for Life. Yeah, Antidote to Chaos has pictures in it, and that's brilliant. That's a highly professional book, right? So pictures in a book is great. Uh, chapter titles, not very many books actually have chapter titles. A lot of books just say chapter one, chapter two, chapter whatever. Uh, that's boring for one. But for two, uh, chapter titles are actually great marketing for the chapter. If you you know, are on the edge about the book and you read chapter title, maybe chapter title is exciting to you and it gets you to read the book. It's their pieces yeah, of marketing. Table of contents, people leave out often. That goes hand in hand with chapter titles. Uh, it's the exact same thing. It's like having a map is a beautiful visual to let you know the physical location of where you are in a book. But a table of contents is like, it's the layout, it's the map of the actual data that you're about to read yeah, in Yeah, like book. the table of contents is literally like the map of the book. It's the table <laughs> of contents. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it, and that's exciting. You get to go in there and you get to read if you have chapter names, not just chapter one, chapter two, chapter two. Like, because that would tell you how many pages are in each chapter. Yeah, okay, cool. But if it's got names each chapter, and it's like the boy who lived, vanishing glass, blah, blah, you know, potions master it chapter. It pulls you in. Yeah, it gives you an idea of what's going on. And it pulls you in. It's good marketing. It's marketing for the book. You need 
people to actually read your book. That's the key <laughs> when you write a book. Is a good book gets somebody to go from chapter one all the way to done. The table of contents helps me out. A lot of map, which we said in here, is also a great thing. Harry Potter does not have a map. Uh, Haley Fuchs books do. I, th I believe Furyborn does. It might not. Um, does Akrotar have a map? I don't know if these. I don't know if these ones have maps in them. Yeah, it does have a map. It's got a good map in it too. Maps are great. Harry Potter doesn't have one, and I wish that it did. Everybody wishes that Harry Potter had the map of Hogwarts in there. Yeah, that would be so would cool. Be really cool. <laughs> if it had several pages. That would be amazing, but they left the map out in there. She was so silly when she did that. And it, <laughs> that really makes me sad because they put in the effort of drawing the pictures for each chapter. Like they got an artist to run through that and do that and great, but they don't have a map. And they should have had a map from, you know, book one. There should have been a map in there. Um, Boo-hoo. <laughs> Maps are important. What else we got in here? Back little blurb. You know, that's just traditional stuff. Something that gets left out a lot, though, that people don't... Uh, they, it just gets missed. It gets missed in traditional books, and it's people I must not realize how important it is, but it's important to me, is the headers. Like, Aquatar has them. I don't think Haley has headers. Harry Potter has headers. Uh, it's, you know, usually has... The name of the chapter up top right and then has either the name of the author which uh in aqua dark or thorns of roses it does it has sarah j moss's name up there um or it has just the chapter number right so like harry potter has chapter number and then chapter title, and then chapter title on the so other why page. do you think they're so important the it just makes the page look good it's a good professional look for a page if you look at haley's and i love haley like this is not something that's going to ruin a book it's not going to make you not read it but you can see she doesn't have those in there. And it just looks like uh, it doesn't have its hat on or something. Like, it's whatever, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's just, it's like Dumbledore without his wizard's hat on. He needs his wizard's hat. He just you know? makes it look more uniform and it's complete. The whole uniform makes it look complete. Um, what else? Let me make sure that we got them all. Oh, yeah. In, the picture of the author is great. I actually just added that into the list because I saw... Uh, the picture of Claire Legrand on the inside of her uh, her book sleeve, right? And all the beauties in the book sleeve. If you just take the book sleeves off, almost every single hardback book, you just have the blank book. Sometimes you got some titles on there. I feel like I wish um, that there was still the title on the actual cover instead of just the sleeve. Yeah, Haley Fee yeah, says exactly. that. Yeah, like, exactly. And that's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, that's the way that. to go. Yeah, let me see if I can punch that in really quick. Let's get that closer here. Yeah, so if you guys can see, like, that's great. That's good work. That's amazing. Yeah, good job. Haley crushes it. She's uh, mm -hmm. probably the best independent published author out there. She's working. She's she's doing some crazy stuff, too. She's working her ass off. She's got a crazy ground game. and I can go on about that stuff, but I want to stay focused on here, the header. It's very important to have a header at the top. Right. Um, so I think that that's everything we went through. Testimonials are great too. Like, you know, somebody's read the book and appreciates the book, especially if it's, it's somebody you know. Well, yeah, you you want that um, brings like confidence uh, to the book, and it also brings some uh, what would you call that? Clout. <laughs> it brings you some clout. Brings the book some clout. So that's cool. So yeah, table of contents very important. Don't forget that one. Header. That just looks professional. It's good to do. Chapter titles. Don't be lazy with your chapter titles. Name them. Even the most famous of authors sometimes don't name their chapter titles. There's not one single one of them I won't call lazy. <laughs> yeah, that's just not good work. Um, so, because it, it, it's so exciting. Like the chapter, I can tell you the chapter titles of Harry Potter. I can tell you them. Uh, like the man with two faces, right? Uh, the Forbidden Forest, I and mean, we just looked at some of these, so it's like kind of cheating. I'm trying to think of some that aren't through the trap door, you know? The Mirror of Erised, right? Yeah, Isn't I think that that that's chapter 12. <laughs> yeah, The Mirror of Erised, I think it's chapter 12. Um, good job. Cool. Yeah, and the sorting hat, oh, it's crazy. The chapter tiles, they bring you back to the book, too, like right now. Like you got this nostalgic, mm -hmm. um, you got the nostalgic feeling and memories from reading the book and you tie them into, you know, that one defining like line, which is the chapter title, which 
I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, like if you say the sorting hat, you're like, oh, that's the chapter where Harry gets sorted into Gryffindor for the first time. You, you see how much easy the marketing becomes. Like when that you have somebody who's read the book, you're giving them a tool to tell other people, like, oh, there's this one chapter, the sorting hat. That's the chapter right there. You don't want somebody going like, oh, chapter thirteen. Yeah, when, when you hit chapter thirteen, that's it. no, you want all oh, the sorting hat chapter, dude. That's where it's that at. Sense. That's it's so it. <laughs> It's, it's just communication. It's writing. Your goal as a writer is you're selling ideas. Each sentence needs to sell the next sentence. Each paragraph needs to sell the next paragraph. Each page needs to sell the next page. And each chapter needs to sell the next chapter. You should have chapter titles. I pretty much beat that dead horse <laughs> into the ground. Um, yeah, I haven't even written a book, so talking about this stuff. If, you, if we were like, oh, and we've been writing our asses off, right? We've been writing for... Years. Years. <laughs> We've been writing for years trying to finish this book. We're almost done. We're going to finish our book within the year. It's um, exciting. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's really exciting. But if you asked me, if you like, how did you figure out, you know, all this stuff about these books here? It's like, it's not that hard. I picked up a Harry Potter book, the most popular book ever, and just opened it up and looked at the components of it. And what I found, I found the pictures, man. I just pictured mm -hmm. every, the list. I found this list right here. The only thing it doesn't have is it doesn't have... Doesn't so have the math, and that makes us all really sad. Yeah, we should make a video just ranting about it, not having a map. <laughs> Give us a map. I would do a good job on that one. <laughs> you are good at ranting. <laughs> I'm jazzed up right now too. I think that that is all that needs to be said. So go out there, if you're a writer, go sell, publish your book, get a hardback, and do it right, and blah 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 blah. blah. Bye. <laughs> Say bye. Bye. Say it again. Bye. Say it again. Bye. Say it again. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I don't think I even looked at it. What's up, Instagram? I'm Kimmer. I'm Janoa. This girl right here, Janoa, has been reading Game of Thrones for I don't know how long. Uh, I think she just started, but she's going to tell you a little bit about it, what she's, like, thinking that's exciting about it, and hopefully get me to read it, which... You should. It's worth it. <laughs> yeah. Why is it worth it? Um, well, as with every book, TV, movie series, whatever, the book is so much better than the TV show. The TV show, don't get me wrong, is probably one of my favorite ones ever, but after reading this book, everything just... It, it makes so much more sense and it flows together and you get so much more of the characters. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, yeah. So tell me then, like, what are you getting out of it that's more? Like, you told me you like the descriptive writing that's in it. What's different between this and, like, Akotar and other books that you've read? Like, why does that stand out for you? Well, specifically what I noticed in this book that I haven't noticed before is that he uses brilliant imagery to take up space when something else that's not super exciting is happening. So, you know, someone's being beheaded. That's exciting. That makes you want to keep reading. But if, you know, if we're eating dinner, we're talking, then you, he uses really vibrant imagery to make it come to life. Okay, so do you have an example? Like, show me what's that <laughs> like. Like, what's that? All right, I got a couple for you. Okay. Give me one second. I'm waiting. I'm on my <laughs> toes. I can't wait. I love Game of Thrones, so if there's a reason for me to get into it. It's really worth it. There's a reason for me to get into it. Then I w I'm intimidated by the size. I know. It seems intimidating, but it went by really fast so far. What you got, girl? You don't have this already marked out? I failed it. <laughs> All right, you ready for this? All right. So this right now is the scene where... Uh, the hound is walking Sansa back. So, his fingers held her jaw as hard as an iron trap. His eyes watched hers, drunken eyes, sullen with anger. She had to look. The right side of his face was gaunt, with sharp cheekbones and a gray eye beneath a heavy brow. His nose was large and hooked, his hair thin, dark. He wore it long and brushed it sideways, because no hair grew on the other side of that face. The left side of his face was a ruin. His ear had been burned away. There was nothing left but a hole. His eye was still good, but all around it was a twisted mass of scar. Slick black flesh, hard as leather. 
pocked with craters and fissured by deep cracks that gleamed red and wet when he moved. Down by his jaw, you could see a hint of bone where the flesh had been seared away. Sansa began to cry. He let go of her then and snuffed out the torch in the dirt. No pretty words for that, girl? Dang. He seems so much scarier in this book. In the show, I felt like they almost made you pity him a little bit. Not in this book. He is scary in this book. That description of him was extremely vivid. Like, it made me... It popped, my eyes popped. Like, that was actually... Yeah, that was in it. I don't know if that's so much descriptive writing is when something's... Yeah, that was... It wasn't... That scene wasn't more of a... Not as exciting scene, but I just couldn't pass up that imagery there. Yeah, that's a great description. <laughs> yeah, that, there's like... It really makes you visualize like what he looks like, and it's mm. disgusting. And it shows her point of view from it, too, how disgusted and terrified she is of it. Yeah, and she and, should be. And he's much more, it sounds like, damaged than he was in the movies, or the show, or whatever the Exactly, he's so much scarier. <laughs> yeah, looking. Well, it, no. Yes and no. Yes, he's scarier looking, but he's a scarier person in this book. I bet you. I heard that the Game of Thrones book is... Darker. Way darker than what they portrayed so far in the show, or I guess show's over. So what they portrayed in the show, I heard it's way darker, dark stuff. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Good job. That was a good descriptive writing. That was crazy. I know. Yeah, it, the bubbling blackness. I know the, the bone, wet. Ooh. <laughs> the wet. Yeah. Yeah, that one got me. I was like, ooh, That's doesn't seem clean. <laughs> cool. Well, the reason what? So I'm glad you did this. I love analyzing. Writing that's like that, that pulls you into the story and really gives you something that you remember. Because I think that's the most important part of being a writer is making sure that the reader is engaged. That they remember. Yeah. Something that you read that you're like, oh, I remember that. It sticks with you. It makes yeah. an impression. It's a huge, yeah. It, it uh, inspires imagery in your mind and it stays there. That'll stay there. That was, I'll, I'll never forget. Like, I've never read any of that book, but what you just read. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> I won't forget it. Cool. I think that covered that. Hey, I'm Kimmer from Kimmer's Books. This is Che Noah. Hello. I want to talk to you today about Aragon. I've been reading The Inheritance Cycle. It's written by Christopher Paolini, who wrote the book when he was 15 and became a New York Times best-selling author <laughs> at 19. It is crazy. What's even crazier is the book was self-published. An author saw it, picked it up, said, somebody's going to publish this. And it is. It's an amazing book. The writing in particular is amazing. I think the story's average. The story's okay. There's elements to the characters, though, that are not average, and it's one of the things that drew me in, like the relationship that Aragon has with Brom and particularly with Sephira, the dragon. So it's a coming-age tale about this farm boy, right, who ends up getting this dragon, and when he touches the egg, he gets this glossy thing on his hand, which is that's this... The beginning of the connection. That's the beginning of the mental connection that Christopher communicates in this book through italicized writing where Aragon and Sephira can communicate through their thoughts. And um, it's a wise dragon, and she's a female, and he's a male, and it's got this motherly friendship, mentoring element to it, where she helps him throughout his journey of having to make decisions on who to trust, what, you know, what path to take when a fork is in the road, one to save somebody, and one, you know, to escape, whatever it is, right? When you go in these big fantasy epic adventures. And... Um, there's things in the writing of it that changed the way that I write when I read this. It's a big wordy book. You like the wordy Which I actually was one of my favorite things about this book is he actually took the time to paint a beautiful, beautiful picture of everything. You really feel like you're in it and you can visualize everything. And it's just so, so much fun to read. She likes the painted pictures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you watched the last segment with the hound, then you know that Che Noah likes... I like the image. She likes his painted <laughs> pictures here. So uh, to me, you know, he used words in a way that I had never seen before. Like when he described some of the eyes, like liquid liquid blue eyes, it's like, whoa, okay. I've, I've never heard words like combined in a way that has this description that really visualizes what's going on. That That's new. And that's, I think, the reason why this was uh, such a poll and got published. Like I think 
in describing what the uh, the whatever the dwarves' lair is. It's like this mountain that's got all these shining, like lit up houses with all these lights, and he used the, the description of a perfectly cut gem, you know, or something like that. This, the analogies he uses are incredible in this Inside book. That that scene stood out so never. I don't think I've ever read anything I thought was so beautiful. Yeah, you've been talking. That's the one that you made me read this book for. Yep. Uh, and that's way later in the book. That's towards the end. I actually just read that a couple of days ago. Um, but it's the chunking of the chapters that caught me. There's w- one thing that's different from this book than, like, say, Harry Potter is in Harry Potter, there's not very many chapters. She's a longer writer. There's more words per chapter than there is in Aragon. Uh, but he chunked this book up in a way where it communicates very clearly the ideas and what are normally very short chapters with the exception of a few. And that was fascinating to me because I enjoyed re- it made it so I could read the book. I don't like I got so much stuff to do, right? Like just like every ordinary person does. The problem with reading a book is that you can't do other things, right? An audiobook helps because you can listen to that while you take care of the kids, while you clean the house, whatever it is you got to do. But uh, it's difficult to sit down and read a book because time is so valuable these days. Everybody's got, you know, a job. Everybody's got kids. Some people have more than one job. You got your hobbies. You got to take care of your body. You know, all these things. You got to take care of your loved one, your girl, whatever. Um, so when I wanted to sit down, I wanted to accomplish something quick. Meeting milestones. And Aragon did that, right? Shorter like, chapters make it easier to feel yeah, there was short, like, I like, I flipped through it really quick. I was like, oh, this chapter is seven pages. I can read that in five freaking seconds, you know, whatever it is. And um, that I really liked, and it changed the way that I wrote. I ended up shortening several of our chapters, cutting them in half, um, just to communicate the small idea that's in that and then say, hey, if you can communicate that idea well enough, if it's chunked in a small chapter, then, you know, you should be able to sell the next idea if it's a good, you know, that's a good point to cut the chapter. Just keep that one idea isolated and move on once the idea is clearly cleaved in the writing with your story. It really makes it so much easier to understand, too, and it, remember. It does, and I really, really like the milestone. I really like the milestones. That's one of the things that fascinated me about Lord of the Rings. Like, the Fellowship of the Ring is it's two books. It's not one. It's in one novel, but there's two books in it. If you open up the book, book one ends when Frodo gets to Rivendell. And that's the, that's the end of book one. If you look it up, you broke it in two halves. Uh, so that's something that's been fascinating, this chunking, you know, the breaking up the story structure by either midpoints or in this book, just keeping those ideas small, right? And keeping the chapters small is uh, is something I really appreciated. And it, not every author is into that. Like there's ideas then concepts that are big that like to be communicated. Like in Harry Potter, you know, she goes four and a half thousand words because she wants to wrap up Uncle Vernon going out on the car driving and tie that very close into Harry Potter actually showing up on his front door, right? So she takes those two ideas and makes it one chapter because they're so closely knit. They're pretty much one concept. That makes the chapter longer. The chunking in this, though, highly appreciated. And uh, that's all I got to say. What do you think? you think Aragon's? It was one of my favorite reads. Yeah. I've read quite a few books. <laughs> there you go. It's very enjoyable. I'm Kim O'Reilly from Kimmer's Books. This is. I'm Chinoa. <laughs> I'm Chinoa. Oh, voice is so much deeper than mine. <laughs> so. We've been, uh, I've been writing a book for six years, probably over six it's years. Been longer than that, hasn't it? It's been a while. And we're almost done. We're about to wrap this book up here this year. And it's, Finally. An, it's an inspiring <laughs> book. Uh, I read chapters of it now and I get goosebumps. You know, I start crying. Like the ideas are crazy. They're emotional. They're personal to me. I think they mean something. I think they'll mean something to other people. It's a huge project, a huge chunk of my life. Um, and you came on you know, two years ago, and we've done some really special work together. Yeah, I think so too. So what I wanted to talk today about is how that special work is, what we've done, and particularly like some changes in the the mm-hmm. concept of like being a free writer and giving up your ideas to serve the story, which is something that we've had to do, 
you know, throughout the writing process, Chano has been telling me, yeah, for two (laughs) years that I needed to fix something. And I was like, from the beginning, I have been trying to get him to just do this one thing. And I was like, it'll make it so much better. And finally did it. And it is so much better. (laughs) It fixed so many issues. So, (sighs) (laughs) uh, for about two years, Chano has this incredible ability She's like another half to my writing. Like she's my girl, but also when she reads and she does critical thinking and critiques my writing, she actually covers my blind spots really well. And vice versa. Very accurately. (laughs) Uh, I'm more technical. She's more emotional. And uh, she's been telling me for a long time that there's too many ideas stuffed into this third chapter. Originally, when I wrote this chapter... There was a very long paragraph before it that eclipsed this time lapse. Like of 15 years. A big time lapse for the main character. And uh, I got rid of that and we did all this cool fancy flashback stuff, which nobody likes that stuff in the third chapter. Really anyways, nobody likes flashback stuff, yeah. right? Just give the character good development. And uh, she'd been telling me for two years there's something wrong with the third chapter. And she had even given me the idea of just taking, you know, those concepts and putting them in the proper sequence of um, actually of going through the events in the time that they happened and giving them some more life. And I know that you didn't think it would turn into what it did. Like, yeah, that's a, true. A common <laughs> uh, a common issue with writers is that they don't know when to stop writing. Their book gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. And that's not what happened here. What what we decided to do finally, I listened to her is. Uh, I took that section of time, put it in its proper sequence in the timeline for what happens as far as, you know, story events. And that one paragraph turned into three chapters and they're beautiful. They tell the story in a much more engaging way. It actually made the it actually made the story move faster. It didn't slow it down because the stuff that happens in the story, the information that you learn quicker, you understand it. Because it's got a deep connection now with the main character. Exactly. It's so much more developed. And one of the things that I really like about it, too, is it covers some of the defining moments in the main character's history that really I only connected with as strong from uh, the Berserk manga series. I've never read a manga in my life, but I, I read all of Berserk. And Berserk covers a good portion where the main character guts. He's a kid, right? It covered in a good section of it, too. And so when we did this, I was like, whoa, we're getting to see how the gears like turn in this person, how she grows to become who she is yeah. and uh, the family around her, too, and all the dynamics. Uh, they played out really, really well. So this is one of those things I should have listened to you a lot sooner. It happens occasionally. <laughs> and didn't. And it's also the lesson of writing, which you're going to fall prey to when you write again and again and again and that's that you can't be too attached to your ideas gotta be open-minded everything you do has got to serve the story Mm -hmm. um and if you get too attached to an idea and it doesn't serve the story then you're gonna run into a wall and that's what happens like when you run into a wall ask yourself like is everything that's going on right now does it serve the story is everything that's going on right now is it respectful to the character development Sometimes you get attached to ideas that sound cool, look cool visually, or cool locations, whatever it is, right? Something, just an action, a weapon, whatever the hell it is. And uh, you think that you got something special, and it actually just doesn't doesn't belong where it is, and it's causing you... It's actually, it's like handcuffs. It's, it's actually... Everything you do has to have a purpose to leading somewhere else. Yeah. There has to be a purpose for everything that you're putting into the story. If you're a good writer, some people, this, and I will say this right now, this whole pantser thing is, is crap. Like some of you pantser or you plotter, if you pants just to get the ideas jotted down and then you want to go add more elements into the story and you want to go add, you know, character and structure and whatever. And that's just the way you do it is you just jump on it and write. Then if that's what pantsing is for you, then fine. But if pantsing is starting at the beginning and going to the end and saying you got yourself a story, you're writing a bad story. I mean, you you need to have structural elements into it. You need to know where you're going. Yeah. And when you do things that don't serve the story because you think that they're cool ideas, like kind of like what I was doing. I was trying to stick too close to a structure um, that I was aware of and, and really liked the pacing of, but didn't serve my story. So we had to break 
Um, and that, if we didn't do this, which we could not have, we could have totally not decided to do this and we could have moved forward. Yeah. I, the book would not have been nearly as good. Yeah, I don't think it would have been as impactful. It's a special product. It's really special. It's a, it's a, it's a really special thing now. And I'm really proud of it. I can't wait to get it done. Me too. I feel so lucky that I get to be a part of this. Me too. I don't feel like it's not even my idea. It's like <laughs> God-given or something. It's crazy. Uh, hey, thank you everybody for listening and chit-chatting with us. Uh, you join right in? Yeah. 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 <laughs> She's lying. Sometimes it's not fun. <laughs> well, obviously. Nothing's fun all the time, especially if it's something that's hard. And usually the best things in life are hard to do. That's true. <laughs> Anything worth doing, there's a journey to it. So It's been fun. It's like reading Game of Thrones. <laughs> so long i'm scared to do it i don't want to do it do it thanks guys <laughs> uh let me see you back